Welcome back. Uh, this is Physics Unit 5.3. We're going to be looking at work done by both gravity and by springs and conservation. This is where it all ties together. This, to me, is one of the most fun units of physics. Not because you might be thinking it's fun of in the sense of, you know, I have no idea what. But it's because you can work a bunch, a bunch of problems. You can now work problems from your last units you couldn't work. So it really changes. If you learn this unit, it will get you through a lot of material in physics and this fundamental idea. We're going to look at two things. We're going to look at work both done by gravity and work both done by spring. So I guess the easiest way, if we're going to talk about work being done by gravity, let's look at work being done by gravity. So let's take a look. Sorry, my little thingy's a little out of whack on here. And my headphone's a little short, so I'm going to take off my headset, but talk really loud. So if we can take a look, work done by gravity, here. Well, work has just been done either against gravity or by gravity. Something, a force, must be used, so work is being done. So in order to do work, notice how this had to change elevation. We have a displacement in the y direction, although we don't really call it displacement, it's just distance. And so here we go, we can also do work. So we can do work if we... Yahtzee, all the way across the room. So this object can do work. Well, likewise, we can take a look, say, for example, at El Pringo can, though. Can a rubber band do work? Well, yeah. If you take a rubber band and do the same thing by cordon, you displace it, you stretch the rubber band, and some rubber bands are springier than others. But if we take this spring, this rubber band, and we stretch it, displace it, Stretch the rubber. Stretch the rubber band. If we stretch the rubber band, wow, that's terrible. This is a video, not just missed. <laughs> Get out of here! I'm a can assassinator. No weak game. Okay. So let's take a look at these two examples. Of what we just saw. I think this video could get my lowest YouTube ratings of all time. But anyway, ah, here we go. Now where were we? After all that excitement, I kind of lost track. Unit 5.3, work done by gravity and springs. So let's take a look at this. What would the equation for work done by gravity look like? Work done by gravity. I need to put my headset back on probably. Okay, much better. Work done by gravity is equal to mgy initial minus mgy final. Now, this is the way we always memorize it. Now, MGY itself, potential energy, the term potential energy, is given as MGY. So we call that potential energy. Now, this is potential energy. If anything, we call this potential energy of gravity. I'm going to put a little G on that potential energy. MGY in this case. Um, now, that means also we could rewrite the potential equation. Uh, the work gravity equation, we could rewrite it as potential energy initial minus potential energy final if we wanted to. But I'm going to put a star by this one. This is the one we memorize and use. Although of equal importance, though, you need to memorize that potential energy is mgy. So still a very important equation all in its own regard. All right, so now let's take a look at the equation for spring. Well, both of these equations look very similar to each other. Work done by spring, and I'll put a little s there for my spring, is equal to 1 half kx i square minus 1 half kxf square. Now, I guess we might have to explain this a little bit. Now, the mgy makes perfect sense. You know these terms already. Mass, g for gravity, 9.8, at least if you're here on Earth. And then y meaning our displacement in this vertical direction over here. With this spring, if you've never really studied a spring before, let's kind of break this down a little bit. One, this also is similar to this equation. One-half kx squared 
is equal to, that's potential energy as well. But this represents, kx squared represents potential energy of a spring. Now, people always get this equation mixed up. This equation is not Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law, let's just do a little separate line over here. Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law is actually F equals, and it's really negative KX. And people are always asking, why is there a negative sign? Well, reality of it is, I rarely use this negative for general problem solving. It's because when you stretch a spring, it's a restoring force. And that's why it's given this negative KX. So we're still, though, left with the same problem. Even the Hooke's Law, which tells us force governed by a spring, this tells us potential energy by a spring. What does K and what does X mean? These could be new terms. K, K is what's known as a spring constant. Spring constant. And basically a spring constant is how springy is the spring. Some things are very easy to stretch, while some things are very like, I can't do it. Very hard to stretch. Now, people always forget the unit for K. Well, don't. All you got to do is remember Hooke's Law. Look at the equation for Hooke's Law up here. It's going to be K would be F over X. And you know what the unit for X is. It's a displacement. So that means K would be measured in Newton slash, it'd be a Newton over a meter. And so technically X is just a spring displacement. Which just simply represents how far is the spring been displaced? Have you stretched the spring? That is all X is referring to. And most of the time on these problems, the spring is either going to be, it's going to be stretched at the beginning or it's going to be released, relaxed at the end. One of two times. Most spring problems will give you two lengths. They'll tell you like a spring is this long. And they'll say the spring is then stretched to a length of such and such. So it might say that the spring is 2 meters. And then it'll say 3 meters. Now, I'm going to be honest. What I usually do is just what I would say in this problem that x initial would be 0. And then I would just call x final. I would say that that spring was stretched an x of 1 meters. The spring was actually stretched 1 meter. I don't care how long the spring is. I just want to know this how far it's been displaced in the question. And I'm going to go ahead and put a star by both of these because I find both of those equations to be very important as well. All right. So I think we can actually work a problem right now at this point. So let's go ahead and do this before. And I may make a separate video where we do conservation of energy with this. I'll still call it Unit 5.3, but we might call that video Unit 5.3 continued at that point. All right. So let's go ahead and do this problem, and then we'll stop this video, and then we'll go back and shoot another video. All right. So the next problem we're going to do is this one. Unit, uh, here we go. Example D is what we're doing. A 60-kilogram skier is on top of a slope uh, shown in this, which you can't see, this picture up here. So there's a skier on top of a ski slope. Looks like he's 10 meters vertical displacement off of the ground. And this one's really just wanting us to find potential energies. That's all it's saying. So we've got a problem where there's a skier on top of a hill. And it says that the hill vertically is 10 meters. So let's get us a skier up here on top of the hill. Happy skier. Let's give him a set of skis there. So there's our skier on top of the hill. It says he's got a mass of 60 kilograms. Uh, what else does it tell us? It tells us the 10 meters, and that's it. All right. What it wants us to do, it wants us to find potential energy due to gravity. So this problem is just wanting us to do MGY, and that's it. But it says in part A, it says set zero at point B. So it gives us this is point B, and that's point A. So it wants us to make this point, it wants us to say at this point Y is zero at this point. So what I was trying to do, set the zero level for potential energy at point B, find the potential energy of the skier at both points A and B. 
Well, if that's y is 0, this y up here would be 10. So if we want to find potential energy due to gravity at point A, we would go mgy, 60 times 9.8 times 10, and we would have our answer, 600 times 9.8. 5,880. So there's our potential energy at that point using this as a zero location. Now it says find the potential energy due to gravity at point B. Well, we'll just go MGY again, and we've got the same thing 60 times 9.8. But at point B, Y is zero, which means your potential energy at point B is also a zero value. So that's what it wants us to do. Now I'm going to sped, it just wants us to flip this around. So let's see, find the gravitational potential energy and find the difference between the two. Well, I think we can clearly see the difference is 5,880, so I think we can just skip on. Now it says, ooh, now this is neat. For part B, it wants us to do the same problem. B part of this question is the exact same problem. Skier up on top of the slope. 10 meter difference in the elevation between there. Point A, point B. But it says this time, make this point zero. So this point's going to be my zero, which I always make wherever the person's starting at. My initial I always make that a zero anyway. Which means in this problem, what would be y at point B? If this point is my zero, what is my y displacement? Well, we are, think about xy coordinate systems. We are down 10 meters. So y at this spot would be negative 10 meters. Now it wants you to do the same things again. Find potential energy at both A and B. Well, potential energy at due to gravity at point A would be MGY, and yes, I write the equations every time so that you memorize MGY, and this would be 60 times 9.8 times, well, look at it, zero, so times zero, so our potential energy at that point is zero. Now let's look at this other location, potential energy at due to gravity at point B, MGY again, and this is 60 times 9.8 times, we are now at negative 10, which would give us the same numerical answer as our last response, only the value would be negative 5,880 joules. And so our difference this time is a difference of negative 5,880 joules. Anyway, so that is a little primer on using potential energy. Uh, come back for the next video, Unit 5.3 continued, and we'll actually work on uh, involving springs and tying basically this whole chapter together at this point.